Thank you very much for the invitation, and my part will be uh, hopefully quicker and maybe less fancy than the uh, best test. They're all more, uh, I mean, senior experience than me, and I learned most of what I do from my uh, eternal mentor, Dr. Boris here. So, my part will focus on the management of venous malformations and patients with double stranding syndrome. Um, we still, again, have the same poor definition of risk. We don't know if clots come from which vessel. We don't scan all the patients to actually map out all these malformations. And you'll still see patients who have been going to great centers for 10 years and nobody checked the abdomen, for example, because of disease in the legs. And most of their issues will become likely from the abdomen and pelvis. So, um, I dealt also with the conservative treatment since I started this work and started dealing with patients with lipo. I'm, I'm not a big believer of conservative therapy if you can do something. If you're born with something wrong, if you can remove it, remove it, damage it, it close it, do something about it, rather than waiting until it becomes really a definitive risk and then handling it at that age will become a much, much bigger process. Or you actually can lose, similar to, for example, some of the kids here where we said PE is getting the long at the age of 18 we probably lost a decent chunk of the lung function. Uh, imaging and clinical correlation, still, uh, we, we just wait sometimes until symptoms happen and then we image the patient. It can be a bit late. I'll show you some examples. And in the uh, clinical guidelines that were released last year for management of lipo training syndrome, uh, which is which was done by a group at Children's Hospital Boston, that's when I was center. We did adopt the early and co definition of risk and, and treatment. And these guidelines are available now online um, for anyone who's interested in looking at them, just discussing different aspects of it. Now, looking at the older classifications of things, now I, I had these two sophisticated descriptions of, by two groups describing these veins. The truth is, I believe it's a bit more sophisticated than this, and some of the less common ones are actually the ones that are more common. But these veins, again, are deceptive. It depends on where you inject and how you inject. You can create the map for why. Uh, at one point, we should probably think about the risk and then map out these veins universally. Now, apply the same protocol. I'm a big believer of protocols, just at least for one time in life. If the patient, for example, doesn't have a big mesenteric vein, you're done with that risk. You don't have to image it again, but you need at least to image it at least one good time in life at any age, uh, at the age of presentation, at, after birth, and then deal with these risks. I'm not going to go over risk here because you heard about it again. Now, thinking about the, the venous anomalies, they can be predictable in many patients with a clipple. For example, this leg here, you know, you see the main impression in the skin, you know, there's a huge bang. You, you raise the leg out, it gets smaller, so uh, maybe a little. But what about this one here? Um, well, this is just a tiny little disease here, and she doesn't have really a lot of symptoms. She was more concerned about the look. But she was the one, unfortunately, who died from the PE. So now looking at the leg and predicting the risk by the clinical examination alone and underestimating the risk of the stuff that can, happens in the pelvis and up could lead to some issues. Uh, there's no easy way to figure out clinically whether this is a big vein and whether the big vein connects with a big tunnel to the, to the central veins and that carries a big PE to the lungs, or the vein just ends up with lots of branches. So even if you have a clot, it will be contained in the legs. So if you have less risk, you will have an annoying clot, but not a lethal clot. Okay. So some of the factors, again, are not all mechanical. I think they're almost a combination of factors. But I deal with the mechanical factor. And sometimes if you want to think, of, think about it simply as a plumbing thing, like biological plumbing, it's something similar to that. This is a patient with factor V plate deficiency. And that predisposes patients to clotting. This is why you see this giant big minor vein in this patient who was not treated for the veins, the veins were left in the leg, and then you inject the legs and he plotted the imperial indicator from here down, and all that he drains into are these abdominal wall veins uh, to the side. So you plotted the entire 
circulation. So that's just an additional factor which made um, his risk a bit higher. With imaging, sometimes the veins are the smallest thing in the image. So out of all these hyper, or the white changes here, this is the vein, and this is the likely one that can walk into those issues. This is another vein over here, and now from looking at many of these cases, you can tell which are the ones that have higher risk here, as Dr. Boris showed, for example, this is the sciatic, which is very, very common, by the way. Those described less than other veins, and I believe the sciatic carries the highest risk and the biggest size. Uh, this is the sciatic here, and sometimes it's smaller than MRI because these kids are just sitting on it, or they lay on the back, and they compress the vein, so the vein is not very impressive. Just inject it and distend it, and you'll see just some, some huge vein. Similar to... Now, with the diverting the flow, as Dr. Boris uh, showed in some of the pictures, if you inject the leg, standard venography, you're going to get into this. So nothing is filling from the deeper veins. But actually, this picture here, all these veins are abnormal, and they're not needed. I don't believe you have to wait in those. Just deal with them when she was two years old. Now, after diverting the flow and putting some tourniquets and changing some of the projections here, you can tell that this is the deeper vein, uh, or deeper veins, going up to the leg, and none of those were visible here. And all of those need to be disconnected, and they should be disconnected from the pelvis up, the whole thing. Um, otherwise, if you disconnect down here, you can leave her with this big vein, which is actually bigger and has a higher risk than the other ones. Uh, these are dark pictures. Are they? Well, they look good. Uh, well, <laughs> things change also over time, so why to wait if you can do it at this age? The patient is in there and see you, you're doing the the study, regardless of the age, close the vein. And it's easier to close the vein that's the size of my pinky here versus closing something that's that big that the industry doesn't even make coils or any products that will help us to close it. These are giant veins at this level of what's about four centimeters. That's almost an inch and a half. So this is a, these are big veins, but in a two-year-old child, these are about one centimeter or less than half an inch, which is manageable by the tools we have. Uh, for these big veins, you have to improvise and use non-FDA approved products, which uh, I don't think there's anything FDA approved for anything we do. For the approval, uh, and often people ask if this is FDA approved, I said just pain is not FDA approved, and suffering is not FDA approved, and the patient is in the table, you do what you need to do just to help the patient. So, patient. so the idea doesn't teach us how to do these things, just let us do what we know how to do. Uh, for minimally invasive techniques for treating those, embolization and spinal therapy often used at the same time. But if you leave left coils or blue, or you leave an evidence behind you that's solid, we tend to call it embolization. Scleral therapy is in, uh, if you inject the sclerosing agent, you want to shrink these veins, dry them up, so similar to injecting veins in the legs so they disappear. The laser relies on uh, passing a wire inside the vein under imaging and turn the laser on and pull out, and as you're pulling out the laser, it will heat the vein from inside and destroy it. Um, increasingly, we move to ultrasound guided phlebectomy, phlebectomy, or ligation, which, um, which is not getting into the massive work that the surgeons do. This still we like to call the minimally invasive, but it for small cut downs or incisions. Uh, what I found that these veins are very, very adherent to the tissue, and they require sometimes some monumental amount of uh, force to pull them out of the tissue around them. Uh, from back to before, painful cloth that are superficial also can be Hold that for a small tiny incisions without. But those are again, these are limited indications. They don't cover the bigger surgical interventions that uh, Dr. Fisherman, for example, spoke about. Uh, we do use filters uh, prophylactically prior to any surgical intervention, especially with, with the higher risk operations where the patient has to stay in that for a long period of time. And hopefully, we didn't get to this level here where you need to do thrombolysis or dissolving the clot that already formed. Uh, this is just showing the principle here. It's not, it's not very difficult once you define those as a normal vein. 
So this is the normal vein here. It gets up into the pelvis, but this guy here is the abnormal vein. And it, you can see the ratio between the normal and abnormal, and why this should be treated as early as possible. You change the angle of your imaging, and you start closing at the edge of this normal going up, and disconnect the abnormal. This is in the pelvis. And it should be done in the pelvis, because that's the point where you have the biggest size of the vein connecting to the other veins. So you just disconnect it from here, and you just do this alone, which we don't do. We close the whole vein. But if you disconnect it over here, you actually prevented the clot from immigrating. It forms anywhere in the leg, going through that pathway. You disconnected that pathway. It's like if you have a, a checkpoint here at the end of the vein, and that will not allow any clot from going up. But if you don't close it all vein, the vein may clot and cause some issues. Uh, some of the uh, theories that we work on initially that deeper veins may improve, similar to other veins, that if you divert back the flow to them, they may actually get bigger over time, because veins require flow to grow. If you deprive any vessel from flow, it will not grow. And again, these darker pictures here, showing the venography in a, I think, two and a half year old child. Um, that was two and a half, I believe this was in 18 months. And you see the marginal vein is filling. It filled even higher. This is the level of the pelvis over here. And all these are, this is a marginal vein and marginal vein branches. But you don't really see a definitive deeper vein. It was a very thin one. And uh, eventually, we managed to see a, a little bit of it if you inject it directly after probably an hour and a half of trying to get into it. However, after the, the fall off, about eight months or so, injecting the same vein in the foot, you get the deeper veins here. Again, they, they may not be the perfect, straight, nice uh, deeper veins, but they're actually functional, reasonable, functional at this imagery. And you have certainly no risk of getting a big clot moving through that vein centrally. So I do believe that right in the flow, and it's, it's better to do it earlier, again, not just because the size of the tools and the time and the risk that you're taking with other patients, but also I believe the veins will have a better chance of getting more flow diverted into them, and hopefully uh, growing a bit normal. That's the same thing here. The venography doesn't show anything before you divert the flow to the, to the deeper veins. And after the vein was, or the veins, the abnormal system here was closed, you still have some um, kind of leftover vein here that needs to be treated. But that vein here is disconnected to this level. So even if it clots again, it's not going to uh, march its way up to the lung. And now we see the deeper veins over here. And they look nicer. Again, this is another child. I don't recall the age. Uh, part of what we also do in the minimally invasive uh, work is to uh, make it safer for patients to go through operations. And this is actually a very crucial thing. Uh, we learned from uh, some surgical experiences that have that patients who are operated on uh, with the bigger veins not treated, they have a much higher risk of uh, clotting and, and pulmonary embolism. Actually, the biggest number of these patients that we've seen uh, with PEs were post-surgical patients. It did not happen immediately the same day, but it's likely to happen some time after that, within the, especially the, within the first few days. Um, and this is why we actually do close, this is one of the patients that was uh, referred to us, it was an adult, a uh, 90 year old dental student from Saudi. And you can see the big pulmonary embolism over here. So he was, he's known to have a clipal, and some small intervention or procedure was done in the cap. Not a big intervention. Went home and he came with this big PD over here. And you can see his big IVC to start with. And when he came to us, look at the clock over here, starting from the pelvis all the way up to here, and this is a huge IVC filled with the clots. And they place the filter over here, but the filter is going to prevent the clots from going up to the lungs, it's not going to prevent clotting. Actually, it may 
make your calling even more likely. So dealing with this giant plot required a tremendous amount of work. But reviewing the image again, let's look at the MRI that was done many, many years ago. You still have the same vein, it's a huge vein, there's a big risk here. Identifying the risk, even if it's not complaining about it, is what about the vesicles in the skin, the leaf, the appearance of the leg, the size. But this was the only thing that people didn't really raise suspicions about, though this is actually the most relevant one acutely to handle, that everything else can wait. Looking at the sphenography, these are the deeper veins. As Dr. Burles showed, this is the popliteal and regional dilatation. The, the, the expansion of the popliteal vein, which is very common. But all these veins are abnormal, and they lead up to here. And once you get to the pelvis, this is a huge sciatic vein. Look at the size of this vein. While the normal vein would be something similar to this. So that was a huge one, and the, the contrast even sits in it, it doesn't move. Because there's no, there's no momentum there in the blood from the size and the, the big branching there. So eventually, uh, that was close from the pelvis down, <coughs> using guide wires. Again, they're not supposed to be left inside the patient, but there's nothing else to close such a huge vein with. And this is the acid work, and again, on him probably for a couple of weeks in the hospital, just to clean the clock. Eventually, he did actually well. And this is the vein overlapping with the, uh, with the, with the wires that you place in the other vein. So if, if one can turn this picture into this picture, and then live, that would be actually very helpful, and I think it would prevent a lot of issues, a lot of issues that you can uh, you know, end up preventing like to this and keep it like this by closing the giant vein that pose this uh, this issue to start with. Uh, one quick note of these uh, percutaneous or ultrasound guided uh, procedures. Actually, you can remove some of the vein um, if you just spend more time. Uh, through small head downs and you just pull them, free them. It takes some time to come out to do some of the veins. Uh, one of the most difficult areas I found were in the foot, uh, where you have that leftover vein with the dorsal of the foot. So you do laser, you close the veins in the pelvis, but we were stuck in the foot and patients will be happy about the vein in the leg and they're happy that the risk of PE is fair, but then the foot is swollen because they're big, these big veins and uh, along the course of the migral vein that comes up to here. So it started removing them in all the patients. It failed probably in a, in a few of them. You just can't pull them out. It's probably easier to pull pieces of the bone than pulling some of these veins. Uh, but eventually, when we started applying it to younger kids, it was, it was actually very gratifying seeing these veins. Instead of lasering them and leaving them with glue or uh, coils, an area that's actually very difficult to leave anything on, because you want them to be out, reduce the risk of clot uh, formation, and reduce uh, any risk of inflammation in the foot here. It, it was probably one of the most gratifying experiences they had in the foot area in patients with the clinical training syndrome. So I, I would do this uh, as part of the initial plan. And again, that's just part of the risk thinking what will improve the quality of life, goes much less risk at this point than dealing with the pulmonary embolism. But it's still, patients, all the patients, as they, uh, as the victim of this figure, and they start thinking about the shoes, this is one of the most frequent issues that they will uh, deal with. So finally, I still believe that the risk should be identified and uh, mapped out early in life. Some is clinical, some is, uh, imaging, and uh, the early management of venous anomalies is what I would always advocate. Uh, and if people ask when, I would say, when you, can, when you can put the child in anesthesia and schedule them. So as early as possible. It's not an urgent thing, but it's better not to leave it until the patient is like 20 and several other issues that you have to handle. Uh, these lists of minimally invasive techniques, I believe, they're not perfect, they're not solving everything. They don't deal with the overgrowth. They uh, certainly can be helpful and uh, safe, 
for multiple indications uh, beyond also the Venus malformations, but this is the topic for today.